finished polynomial functions where the exponents and the variables were whole numbers. We're now going to move into exponential functions and hence the name, the exponent is going to be the variable. So if you take a look at the general form of an exponential function, we have a variable in the place of the exponent a will be greater than zero and b must be greater than zero. Neither of those variables can equal zero. If I put a zero in for a, the whole thing is gone. If I put a zero in for b, the whole thing is gone. We also won't have a negative a value and cannot have a negative b value. And b cannot equal one. If I put a one here, one squared, one cubed, one to the power of four is always one. That doesn't cause the function to grow or decay, so it will not be an exponential function, which will make a little bit more sense here when we take a look at the graphs. In our first question here, y equals two to the power of x is our function. We know it's an exponential function because the exponent is a variable. B is always the base of that power. So in this case, I have a B value of two. A is the number we multiply that power by. And because I don't see it, I know it's a one. It's not a zero. Zero times anything is zero. So A in this case is one. So we're gonna make a note of that. A is one and B is two in our first example. I've got a table of values here, and we can choose any values that we like for x, substitute them in, and generate a y value. I picked these values just because my graph here, I don't want to have to extend my x-axis too far to the left or the right, so these are nice values to work with. Okay, so here we go. So in the first one, we're going to figure out what is y when x is negative 3. So we know from previous years, if we have a negative exponent, then we reciprocate the base of the power and then the exponent becomes positive. One to the power of three is just one. Two to the power of three is eight. So when x is negative three, y is one eighth. That's our first coordinate point we can plot on our graph. So when x is negative three, y is one eighth, which is 0 0.125. So just go a little bit above the x-axis and there approximately is our first coordinate. Okay, so here we go again. So now x is negative two. So we have two to the power of negative two. And again, we reciprocate the base, which flips the sign on the exponent. So now we have one quarter. So when x is negative two, y has a value of one quarter, and now we can plot that. When x is negative two, y is one quarter, so we are going to be about there, just a little bit higher than one eighth. And now we go again. When x is negative one, again, when we have a negative exponent, by reciprocating the base of the power, the exponent switches signs. So this gives us a value of one half. When x is negative one, and again, this is my best job at putting these in an accurate position. Two to the power of zero, well, we know anything to the power of zero has a value of one. So when x is zero, y is one. When x is one, two to the power of one is just two. So when x is one, y is two. When x is two, two to the power of two, or two squared is four. So when x is two, one, two, three, four, there we go up on the y-axis. And two to the power of three is eight. So when x is three, y is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's going to be about there. All right, now I want you to try something. In your calculator, put some different values into test. Is there any value that you can enter for x where we go two to the power of that value and get either a zero for y or a negative value for y? So try putting in, we can see we're getting closer and closer to the negatives if we're moving this way. So try, what's two to the power of negative five? Two to the power of negative 10? Two to the power of negative 20? Can you enter a value for x and get that graph to cross the x-axis. All right, and you're going to see that's not possible. And the reason that's not possible is because we have what's called an asymptote on that x-axis. An asymptote is a line that your graph is going to get closer and closer and closer to, but it's never actually going to touch 
or cross. So I use a red line just to indicate danger. So this is what we call the asymptote. And we know in order to be a function, we can never have a straight vertical line up and down. So when we go to connect this, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to that asymptote, but we're never actually going to touch it. We're also never going up in a straight line. So we're going to angle the graph kind of like that. And that's what we have for an exponential function where our B value is greater than one. So if we take a look at some of these values here, we know it's never going to cross the x-axis because that asymptote lies there. So we will never have any x-intercepts. We also know that a y-intercept occurs when our x-coordinate is zero. So if we take a look over here, we have a y-intercept of one, so we can fill that in. Our end behavior always we're moving from left to right. So we know this is quadrant one, we know this is quadrant two. Our graph comes in quadrant two and goes out quadrant one. So our end behavior is going to be from quadrant two to quadrant one. Our domain is where that graph lies on the x-axis and we can see it's going to continue going to negative infinity. It's also going to continue going to positive infinity. So we just say our domain is all real numbers. So we can say x is going to be an element of the reals. And our range, if we take a look at the y-axis, we know our graph is never going to be below um, zero. So it's also never going to be equal to zero. It's going to get closer and closer and closer. So it's going to be everything greater than zero because it's also going to continue on to positive infinity. So we cannot equal zero, but we are going to put y is going to be greater than zero. And y is also an element to the reals. And just make sure you remember, because of that asymptote, it cannot equal zero. My next example here is also an exponential function. I know that because I have a variable in the place of that exponent. The base of that power is five. So think B for base. I know that my B value is five. My A value is three. That's the number I'm multiplying that power by. We could do the same thing we just did, create a table of values, generate some x coordinates, and then figure out when we substitute those values into the function what we get for y. But we're going to speed this up a little bit here. We're going to go into our graphing calculator. And because this is not regression, we need to turn off that stat plot. So if you still have that on, you're going to go up here, press enter to remove that black box. I'm going to press enter again because I don't want that. And then we can graph this. So we're going to have three. You can do times. I'm just going to follow exactly what we see. We're going to press the exponent key and then we're going to put the variable in the place of that. My window is the default. So I'm going from negative 10 to positive 10 on both axes with a scale of one. And when we go to graph this, we can see that is what the graph ends up being. We already know there's an asymptote that lies on the x-axis, so we will have no x-intercepts. In order to get the y-intercept, if we go second function trace, number one allows us to enter any value for x. So I know there's a y-intercept when x is zero. So if I put that in here, I have a y-intercept of three. So when I go to plot that point, I'm going to put that on my graph here. So when x is zero, we are right on that y-axis. y is going to be three. And then I just went over to the side here and quickly chose a couple of values that I could substitute into this function to generate a specific y-value. So because I can see that my graph rises very quickly, I just went, what happens when x is one? So I said, when x is one, we got y is 15. So x is 1 and then I just kind of approximated 15 would be about there and when x is negative 1 I substituted in a negative 1 which means that x, y is going to be about 0 0.6 or 3 fifths so when x is negative 1 we're going to be about there and then we know the shape of the graph from the calculator so I just kind of sketched in it's really difficult not to go in a straight vertical line but just kind of try your best to angle up there and again we know there's no x-intercepts because of that asymptote we already established that the y-intercept is 3 our graph is coming in quadrant two and it's going out quadrant one. So that's my end behavior. And similar to the last one, X is going to be an element of the real number system as is Y, but Y must be greater than zero because the graph will never be below that X axis.
we took a look at two examples here. In both of those cases, I'm just going to go back to the top here for a second. In both of those cases, we looked at what happens when our B value is greater than 1. So here's my B value greater than 1, and we can see the graph is rising to the right. Here in my second example, my B value is greater than 1, and again, we can see that our graph is rising to the right. If those graphs are rising to the right, it's what we call a growth function, and it occurs when B is greater than 1. So when B is greater than 1, we have what's called a growth function. Our value for Y is growing very quickly. So start to think about where are we going to see that in a real world example. There's one prominent in the news these days, and we're going to get to that in a second here. All right, so that is the first type of exponential function we can have. We're going to now take a look at what happens when b is less than 1. We know if it's greater than 1, it's a growth function. We also know b can't be negative. So that limits us to b being between 0 and 1. So in other words, we're going to have b as a proper fraction or its decimal equivalent. Again, b is the base of the power. There's my exponent as a variable, which makes it an exponential function. So I know that b is 1 half. a is the number in front. And because we don't see it, a is a 1. We're multiplying 1 half by 1. Similar to what we did previously, I can choose any values for x, substitute them into that function, and generate a y coordinate. So I'm going to take this value, and I kept with my negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and so on, on the x-axis, just to make it a little bit easier to graph, given what we've got here. If I substitute negative 3, into the place of x, then again, remember, in order to get rid of a negative exponent, we reciprocate the base. So we're going to flip that base. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. 1 to the power of 3 is 1. And again, remember, because of those brackets, that exponent gets applied to both the numerator and the denominator. So then we can plot that. When x is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, we're going to go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and put a point. And then we're going to continue on. So when x is negative 2, again, we're going to substitute in negative 2 for x. We're going to reciprocate that base so our exponent becomes positive. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. 1 to the power of 2 is 1. When x is negative 2, y is positive 4. So x is negative 2, y is positive 1, 2, 3, 4. And there's another point I'm going to plot. We're going to continue that process and generate our points, and then we're going to connect them with a smooth curve. And we can see that when b is less than 1 but greater than 0, our graph is now falling as it goes to the right. It still is never going to touch across the x-axis because there is an asymptote that lies there as well. And you can even play around with your calculator and see what happens. As x gets bigger, is there any value you can put in there that would give you either a 0 for y or a negative for y? And be careful because your calculator is somewhat misleading. At, when you get high enough, it's going to say, y is 0 because it's rounding to 0, but it's actually not 0. You know that. Okay, so we have no x-intercepts. We're never going to cross, oops, we're never going to cross that x-axis. Our y-intercept, we know a y-intercept occurs when x is 0. So when x is 0, we can see that the y-intercept is 1. So I'll put that in there. We should have a dot there. Our end behavior, we're coming in quadrant 2. We're going out quadrant 1. So we're moving from quadrant 2 to quadrant 1. And again, domain, we have x as an element of the real numbers. And for our range, we are greater than 0. And y is an element of the reals. All right, for our final one, I'm going to jump over here and grab my calculator as well. And I'm going to enter just 8 times 1 quarter to the power of x, and then take a look at what the graph does. And again, the graph is falling to the right. If we go second function trace, number 1, that lets us enter any value for x. So we can put in when x is 0. That gives us our y-intercept. So we know when x is 0, y is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'm going to put that point there. And then we know we're going to be falling to the right. We also know there's an asymptote. So you can go over, generate a couple more points, and then just connect the dots to get that smooth curve.
I got a few more points here and plotted those on my graph. And again, we're going up really steeply. When x is negative 1, y is actually 32. So at this point of negative 1 for x, we're way up here. So I know I'm going to be going up, not in a straight line, but fairly, uh, fairly sharply. Okay, so once we've got that graph drawn, we know there's no x-intercepts again because of that asymptote. We already established the y-intercept is 8. Again, we are coming in quadrant 2 and we're going out quadrant 1 because remember, end behavior is always moving left to right. So we're coming in 2, we're going out 1. Domain, x is an element of the real number system. And again, y is greater than 0 and y is also an element of the real number system. For every value greater than 0, our graph will lie on a point on that y-axis. The first type we looked at were when b was greater than 0 and we had that graph that was rising to the right. Both of these graphs we just did are now falling to the right and so we call those decay functions. b cannot be a negative number, but if it's less than one and greater than zero. Remember, it cannot equal one, it cannot equal zero. If it's between those two values, we have a graph falling to the right, we have a decay function. To conclude, exponential functions are fun and they're fairly straightforward because so many of their characteristics are the same regardless of what the B value or the A value is. So at this point we know there's always going to be a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis which means we will never have an x-intercept for an exponential function. We know that for all of them, we're coming in quadrant 2, we're going out quadrant 1. It doesn't matter if it's growth or decay. The domain is x is an element of the real numbers if we just have a general function and no context attached to it. And y is always going to be greater than 0 and a real number. Now the one interesting thing that you may have picked up on is the y-intercept. If you go back and take a look at the four examples we did, you should notice our y-intercept is always the a value. If we put in a 0 for x, we know a y-intercept always occurs when x is 0. So in every one of these cases, if I put a 0 here, anything to the power of 0 is 1. When I multiply a times 1, I get that a value. So it always, with an exponential function, that y-intercept is your a.